place, meaning that indigenous people, this is a quote, represent a culture emergent from a place, and they actively draw on the power of that place physically and spiritually. This is why I have argued throughout my work that indigenous peoples have creation stories, not colonization stories about how they came to be a place. Yupik elder Oscar Coagli wrote that the cold defines my place. Where I grew up made me who I am. The cold made my language, my worldview, my culture, and my technology. I grew up as an inseparable part of nature. It was not my place to own land, nor to domesticate plants or animals that often have more power than I do as a human being. Finally, Megan Bang and her colleagues' insistence that land is, therefore we are, is not an abstraction. Many indigenous cultures refer to seascapes, mountains, and other land formations literally and not figuratively as ancestors. This is as true in indigenous cosmogony as it is in contemporary accounts of indigenous resistance, such as the October 2013 att attack on Mi'kmaq anti-fracking protesters by RCMP police at Epsilon, writing about the Mi'kmaq mothers, grandmothers, aunties, sisters, and daughters, armed with drums and feathers against the, ported right, uh, the pointed rifles of the RCMP, and their choice to lay, lay their bodies on the land to protest and protect their land from fracking. Leanne Simpson remarks that our bodies should be on the land so that our grandchildren have something left to stand upon. This, like the notion of land as ancestor, is simultaneously poetic and real. It is both a notion and an action. As Steyer's Higbram and Blimke articulated in 2013 in discussing a pedagogy of land. Land refers not just to the materiality of land, but also to its spiritual, emotional, and intellectual aspects. These scholars choose to signify considerations of these aspects in their capitalization of the L in land. Land can be considered as a teacher and as a conduit of memory in that it both, and this is from um, Jody Bird's work, that it both remembers life and its loss and serves itself as a mnemonic device that triggers the ethics of relationality with the sacred geographies that constitute indigenous people's histories. Relationships to land, again, are familial, intimate, intergenerational, and instructive. For example, Manulani Meyer writes that land is our mother. This is not a metaphor. For the native Hawaiian, speaking of knowledge, land was the central theme that drew forth all the others. You came from a place, you grew up in a place, and you had a relationship with a place. This was an epistemological idea. One does not simply learn about land, we learn best from land. Land teaches and can be considered as first teacher. Yupik scholar Oscar Coagli writes that for Yupik people, land and nature are metaphysic and pedagogical. Coagli writes that it is through direct interaction with the environment that the Yupik people learn. What they learn is mediated by the cultural cognitive map. The map consider, consists of those truths that have been proven over a long period of time. As Yupiak people interact with the cold, they carefully observe to find a pattern or order where there might otherwise appear to be chaos. Coagli's rendering of Yupiak relations to land braids together the cosmological, pedagogical, pragmatic, and spiritual. Indigenous writers also caution that discussions of land do not exclude urban land. Land does not only refer to the green spaces outside the urban. We're not more on land now than we would be if we were on Bathurst, another part of Bathurst. Steyer's uh, Hake Brown and Blimke 
also warn against understandings of indigenous knowledge of land as static or perform performable. So when I said that I would give a talk today on the question of can reconciliation take up place, when I, I thought I was being cute, but I put the up in parentheses. Maybe you saw this on some of the signage. And so to me, that means that there are at least three different ways based on how we place emphasis or, or overlook that parentheses of how we can think about that question. So I'm going to take you through those at least three ways. So the first one is the question of can reconciliation take place? So almost exactly two years ago, I was in Ottawa to speak at Congress. And if you remember, if you attended that Congress, um, that meeting coincided with events marking the closing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And there were sacred fire and sunrise ceremonies from May 31st to June 3rd, um, 2015 on Victoria Island. There was a witness ceremony that took place on June 1st. Um, there was the formal release of the final report that happened on June 2nd. And then there was a, a, a pretty sizable walk for reconciliation that happened on May 31st. So I was there to do a keynote for WGSRF. The, and um, my keynote had to do with indigenous feminist theories of change. And I shared some of the work that I had been doing to think about haunting as a theory of change and um, how haunting in settler societies can represent small acts of justice. So at the end of that session, a Métis person from Winnipeg um, named Andrea Durbecker came to talk with me and she talked with me about the thinking that she had been doing about the Canadian, the, the recently opened at that time, uh, still now, uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and about the linkage, linkages between the river um, that was continually the resting place for Indigenous people, for Indigenous youth and women, for trans and two spirit people in particular, people who were loved by their families people who are greatly missed, and the museum dedicated to human rights, which shares its shores. So I'm so fortunate that Andrea ultimately came to the University of Toronto to work on a PhD in the Women and Gender Studies program, and I'm fortunate to be working with her. And I appreciate that Andrea came to talk with me that day, because what it means for me in my own thinking is about reconciliation and especially about reconciliation for residential schooling is that it's always entwined with the ongoing agony of communities continuing to live with women, girls, trans and two-spirit people being murdered and being made missing. Soon after, I moved to Toronto to take a position as Associate Professor of Critical Race and Indigenous Studies in the Department of Social Justice Education at Boise. And I was nominated by the chair of my department to serve on the university's Truth and Reconciliation Steering Committee. So that committee was charged with determining a set of recommendations to share with U of T's president and provost with regard to the institutional obligations to implement the calls to action from the TRC report. So to do that, our steering committee struck a number of working groups, including a working group on curriculum, on students, on group, uh, excuse me, a group on co-curricular activities and a group on faculty and staff. And finally, a group on research and relationships with indigenous communities. So each of these working groups met numerous times in order to think through and share recommendations. And then all of these recommendations were accepted by the steering committee. And we, the steering committee, also crafted our own recommendations. 
and then we brought them together in a report that we shared earlier this year in January with the president and the provost in a formal entrustment ceremony. So I cannot emphasize how earnest of a process this was. And I am a cynical woman, uh, but this was truly an earnest process in which people brought their full hearts to this work. Um, it involved uh, dozens and probably hundreds of people sharing their experiences, thinking about and thinking about what could be done um, at the institutional level to improve the experiences of indigenous people. And um, thinking about connections between those experiences to ongoing occupation and um, what it would mean, what would need to be in place for the university um, to become a place that deserves indigenous faculty, students, and staff. And that was truly the way that we framed that work. Um, what were the material and conditional changes that could be made to help this university become deserving of indigenous students, staff, and faculty? So the report is available and you can download it and take a look at the final effort of all of this work that I'm describing. Um, some of the things that I feel like are the most important about the report is that it acknowledges that the university has had, an on, has had a role in the ongoing expansion of settler colonialism that research, and that researchers have done harm in the past and that uni the university had a role in establishing and maintaining residential schools. So the language from the report says that it must be acknowledged that the university educated generations of political leaders, policymakers, teachers, civil servants, and many others who were part of the system that ran and created the residential schools. More than that, our researchers failed to investigate and challenge the system even when society began to know how profoundly damaging the schools were to indigenous people. In more recent times, some of U of T researchers may well have participated in studies that caused harm in indigenous communities or were insensitive to their needs. More broadly, for generations, the University of Toronto was simply part of a dominant settler culture whose political and social actions have contributed to the profoundly difficult situations that many indigenous people and communities find themselves confronting in the current era. So this was important to me as the granddaughter of a survivor of, um, of residential schools, um, as, the per as a person whose uh, grandmother had samples of blood drawn and kept by universities in Alaska. It was important to me to work in an institution that could make this kind of statement. There are other things that I could definitely say about the turns of phrase or word choice that we discussed as a steering committee that I would have hoped to see in the final report that didn't make it. But as a whole, I'm very proud of that work and felt that it genuinely reflected what happened in our process. So in the months since the completion of the report, I've continued to think about how that work was approached. And I realized that in our work, that while the question of space for indigenous students, indigenous faculty and research, indigenous staff, and then indigenous spaces as a whole was a central question, the question of land was held completely out of bounds. So the terms of our committee, and, and this is really important for those of you who are in your, at, at institutions in which you're engaging in your own processes um, to think about what the, what the mandates around the calls to action mean for your universities. For us, the terms really uh, help, were part of what kept land out of view or out of our mouths. So the terms had to do with recruitment and support for indigenous students, recruitment for indigenous employees, staff and faculty, alumni relations, inclusion where appropriate of indigenous content, and then inclusion of indigenous issues. 
right? So you can see that because these kinds of processes stay pretty close to the terms that are set up for them, if land is not part of those terms, then it's not going to be the university that puts land in the terms. It's quite hard to, um, to get the conversation to go to land <clears throat> because of settler colonialism. Um, so we discussed the need for indigenous spaces at great length and um, it came up in every single one of the working groups and their recommendations. Uh, so this, the, the overall statement around this had to do with the importance that indigenous spaces was a unifying theme in the working group's final reports. Each of the groups emphasizes emphasized that space was central to the indigenous experience at the university and that the current spaces dedicated to indigenous experience were lacking in both number and features. So one of the short term calls to action is that the university should actively explore the creation of significant dedicated indigenous space on the St. George campus. Another one is that a strategy for the funding and placement of more indigenous public art across all three campuses should be developed. And the third one is that the university should begin planning immediately for the creation of dedicated appropriate indigenous spaces at the Mississauga and Scarborough campuses. So One of the things that is made clear in, in my reflection on this is that um, attending to, and, and is made clear I think through attending to the indigenous understandings of land and water that I was talking about early in my paper, is that the difference between land and what's getting, what's getting marked as space in these recommendations. So if it isn't already obvious, it makes sense to say that reconciliation as a term has a larger meaning than reconciliation specifically for the survivors and children and grandchildren of residential schooling in Canada. Reconciliation represents the opportunity for residents in, of the nation state of Canada to, to confront and attempt to redress the, home, the harm that has been done through theft, genocide, dispossession, dehumanization, and active disrespect. Yet, yeah, Sandy Grande has posed the question this way. Can democracy be born out of genocide? We have to take the time to ask whether there is any harmonious future when the past has been so violent. And I think that people will rush to an answer about that and say, well, this is all we have, this is the only past that we have, or we can only go forward. But all of those things are, are um, based in temporal understandings, not spatial understandings. And also, they presume the longevity of the nation state and not the longevity of indigenous peoples and our sovereignty. Settler futurities foreclose indigenous futurities, but indigenous futurities do not do that for all other peoples. So I'm not talking about the distant past, although that past, of course, has been horrifyingly violent. I'm talking about the experience of Colton Bushi's family, his parents on an August night last summer in Saskatchewan when police came to their door and told them in flat language that their son was deceased. Our CMP officers asked Debbie Batiste, Colton Bushy's mom, if she had been drinking. And it was because she had grieved so heavily. Her wounded expression of grief and dismay was so overwhelming to them that they asked if she had been drinking and they smelled her breath. How humiliating to have your breath smelled while you were learning in that moment that your son has been murdered. Colton Bushi and his friends had been swimming and hanging out and they had a flat tire and pulled into the yard of a white farmer named Gerald Stanley. Gerald Stanley shot and killed Bushi and within hours somebody attempted to create a GoFundMe account 
for Gerald Stanley's wife. After it was not permitted to go live by GoFundMe, another more veiled account to bring money to Stanley's family was established, and a steak dinner fundraiser was also planned. I think about this story when I think about the first way for us to think about the title of this presentation. Can reconciliation take place? As in, can reconciliation occur? Is there enough here that begins to feel like enough of a gesture, enough of an intention, enough of a taking of a mutual risk to reconcile? The second way we can think about that question of the, the title of this presentation poses is, can reconciliation take place? Like, and I mean like land grab, take place. Is this all a cover for taking more place? So in this case, and in thinking about the critiques that scholars, including Melinda Smith and Keisha Supernant and Nancy Bray at the University of Alberta have made about the Canada Research Chairs Program, for example, and the ways that new federal rules, which are trying to improve the diversity of that program, don't go far enough. So indeed, they can't go far enough because they don't address the structural problems that are keeping indigenous scholars, black scholars, racial and racialized scholars for qualifying for the program, especially women identified scholars. So this comes shortly after Janice Geary did an analysis of the CRC program, focusing on the chairs that had to do with expertise in indigeneity. And what Geary found is that 48% of those chairs were held by white settler scholars. And so in asking the question of, is this all a cover for like the cottage industry that can be developed around helping different organizations to implement the TRC? There's gonna be a great deal of money made by white and settler scholars under the banner of reconciliation. So what does this conversation, what, what does the veil of reconciliation do in, uh, to allow white settler scholars to take up even more place within institutions, within cities? Finally, with regard to whether discussions about reconciliation can take up place, like can we even have the conversation about land? I have to point out that in universities and in discussions about the need for more space for indigenous faculty and staff and students, for indigenous studies, for indigenous research and for indigenous questions, I don't think that we are ever talking about space beyond a couple of rooms. Like we're fighting for our lives for a couple of fucking rooms. And like maybe a building or a longhouse, but what does it mean to spend years of academic work fighting for a building when mining already has a building on campus? So in, in all of these conversations about what the university does, it's never possible to have the conversation about what the university needs to stop doing. What are the practices, the land-based practices that the university invests in and supports that need to stop because they are undermining indigenous sovereignty, because they are harming and poisoning indigenous people? So what does it mean to try to get space as part of a project of reconciliation when there are extractive industries supported by our same universities that are destroying indigenous land? off campus. So here's another way to think about that. What about when the university owns a lot of land and land that is unseated? What are our obligations to consider that it is time for universities to rematriate their land to indigenous peoples? Can it be on the table? What will it take to get it on the table? that universities 
may need to rematriate land to indigenous people to finally be in right relationship with indigenous communities. Indigenous peoples have, predict, have predicted the collapse of settler societies since contact, all while building and articulating viable alternate epistemologies and ontologies. That theories of decolonization have been taken up across disciplines and academe now rather than prior generations is evidence of the more widely held recognition among settlers of impending and uh, environmental and economic collapse. Anishinaabe writer Leanne Simpson tells Naomi Klein in a 2013 interview that our elders have been warning us about this for generations now. They saw the unsustainability of settler society immediately. Societies based on conquest cannot be sustained. So yes, I do think we're getting closer to that breaking point for sure. Simpson continues, we're running out of time. We're losing the opportunity to turn this around. We don't have time for this massive, slow transformation into something that's sustainable and alternative. I do feel like I'm getting pushed up against the wall. Maybe my ancestors felt like that 200 or 400 years ago, but I don't think it matters. I think that the impetus to act and to change the world and transform, for me, exists whether or not this is the end of the world. If a river is threatened, it's the end of the world for those fish. It's been the end of the world for somebody all along. And I do think the sadness and the trauma of that is reason enough for me to act. Simpson's words speak to both the urgency and undeniability of the need for decolonization. They also hint at the inevitability of decolonization. To say that decolonization is not to say that it is guaranteed or that humans are going to finally snap out of it and start taking action. That's not the promise here. Just as you can walk around in the streets of Toronto and see tobacco growing through the cracks, just as Megan Bang was able to do with her students in Chicago and see where tobacco is growing, even because in spite of all of the things that humans have done. Decolonization is not just something that humans do. Decoloniza decolonization is something that land does to heal itself from what humans do. It is something that land does on its own behalf. Whether or not humans can survive this latter form of decolonization is something we don't know yet. I'm finished. Um, and very thought-provoking. We have about 20 minutes for questions, if anybody has anything they'd like to add. Uh, you've suggested that we take a few minutes for people uh, to talk amongst themselves about what they just heard so we can afterwards. So maybe take about five, ten minutes and then five minutes, five minutes of, of talk please and then uh, we'll come back and chat as a group. <laughs> I don't know if that's my cup anymore. I'll go grab you one. Thank you.